Hi, my name is Adam Eckerly. I'm a senior technical marketing architect with VMware and the Cloud Platform Business Unit. Today we're going to talk about vCenter high availability. A couple of things to know before we get started. First, vCenter HA is comprised of three nodes, an active, a passive, and a witness. Another common question is, what licensing is involved? Well, we just require a single vCenter server instance license that will cover all three nodes. Another common question is, do we support a tiny deployment, which is the smallest uh, size that you can select when you're deploying a vCenter server? And the answer is we do not support that with vCenter HA because of the resources that are involved. Tiny is usually used for lab environments uh, and very small robo instances. So we recommend or require at least a small or higher deployment. We also support embedded PSC and external PSC with vCenter HA. And last, does vCenter high availability equal DR? Definitely not. Uh, we'll get into some of the details of that uh, and the ramifications and the decisions that, that you need to make when enabling vCHA. Uh, but vCenter high availability is just an HA solution. We want to protect vCenter and make it highly resilient within a site generally speaking. So the first thing that we need to do from an architecture perspective is take these clones, right? We have an active, and we clone that over to a passive node. And we also clone a, third, or a second time to a witness node. One thing that we do before we actually initiate the clones is we add a second Ethernet adapter. And this is, is, of, course of, is of course cloned to the witness and passive node. We also have our primary Ethernet adapter, or Ethernet Zero, which is made up of, uh, we'll call it the management interface. And it's comprised of an FQDN, an IP, and a MAC address. Then we also have this interface over on our passive node. I'm drawing it in a dashed line because it is administratively offline, right? If this interface shares both the IP and MAC address, then we'll have some network conflicts if both of these interfaces are online at the same time. So on the passive node, this Ethernet zero or the management interface is always offline. Only when the passive node becomes the active node does uh, it become online and take over the IP and MAC address. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in detail in a moment. So these Ethernet 1 interfaces form a private network we call the VCHA network. The only requirements for this network are that it is different from the management network and that all three nodes can have IP addresses and communicate over this network. It can be uh, over layer three. We don't require all three of these nodes to have layer two connectivity uh, across this VCHA network. However, again, kind of going back to the VCHA is not DR, there's very limited scenarios where you might have a requirement to have these three nodes be on different networks. So generally speaking, these three nodes will be on the same layer two segment, although it is not required. Now that we have the network situated, there are a few other things that make up a vCenter, right? We have a database, and then we have some set of files on the file system that make up the configuration. Configuration files, certificates, uh, things of that nature. And so, we need to get these two things, these two sets of data, over to our passive node. So there's gonna be some replication involved. First, we have the database replication. 
This is a synchronous replication operation. We're just using the native PostgreSQL uh, uh, replication mechanisms to get the data from point A to point B or from the active node to the passive node. The other is a file-based uh, asynchronous mechanism that actually uses a very mature Linux-based uh, synchronization mechanism called rsync. rsync is an on-demand uh, replication mechanism that we're using, uh, and the files that we're replicating are generally pretty small. So usually, even though it's asynchronous, it takes just a matter of seconds to replicate a change from active to passive node uh, when that change occurs. So now that we've kind of dove into the architecture of vCenter HA, let's take a look at what happens when we have a failure. So let's say that our active node uh, has some sort of failure. Maybe the host failed on it, or maybe there's uh, a network failure or some sort. Uh, and so this guy goes away. So now what we're going to do is we're going to bring this interface online. We're going to do a gratuitous ARP to notify the network that now this passive node, or now, as it were, the new active node, has taken ownership of the FQDN IP and MAC address. All right. So now this interface is effectively down. And the other thing is that replication is now paused, if you will. Right? We have a one-way replication. Now that the active uh, node is down and the passive node has become the active, uh, replication, uh, vCenter is online, but replication is now paused. So now we have a couple of choices. One, we can trouble, go ahead and troubleshoot the failed active node. Uh, and if we can successfully troubleshoot it and bring it back online, then the passive node, as soon as it detects, or the active node, as soon as it detects the passive node online, it will reestablish those replication mechanisms. So now we'll do our synchronous database replication this way, and our asynchronous file-based replication that way as well. There's another option that we can take if we have a failed node. When vCenter is back online after the failover, if, for instance, we're unable to successfully troubleshoot the problem, we can go into the vCenter HA configuration and choose to redeploy the node. So this can happen completely non-disruptively. If our, if our old active node, our original vCenter node, is completely just blown away, uh, we can remove it from inventory and then go into the UI and select to redeploy this node, and it will come up. Uh, perform an initial synchronization of the database and the file system, and then it will become the new passive node. Uh, and again, this is all non-disruptive. There's a couple other failure conditions to really talk about. One is, what if we lose the witness? Now, the witness doesn't sit in the data path. Uh, it is just used for quorum services. So if we lose the witness, it's going to be non-disruptive to the vCenter server instance, but now the cluster is running in a degraded state. So all three nodes need to be online and functioning for the cluster to be healthy. If we lose one of the nodes, whether it's a passive node or a witness node, that cluster goes into a degraded state. When the cluster is in that degraded state, we're not able to perform an automatic failover from active to passive. This is a normal mechanism uh, that many cluster uh, solutions use uh, and is really to prevent uh, two actives to come online uh, at the same time. So we talked about this, uh, these two network interfaces and what would happen if they would come online at the same time. That's what we're trying to prevent. So if there is network isolation in the VCHA network, preventing these nodes from talking to each other, vCenter will actually shut down vCenter services to protect itself. Uh, and again, that only occurs when we have two or more nodes that have failed. So this architecture lends itself to an embedded PSC. I talked that we support both embedded and external PSC. And if we're talking about embedded PSC, just know that the embedded PSC runs on the active node. And again, we've cloned it. So it's running on both the active and the passive node. 
uh, and it's a single instance of a PSC. It's not actually two separate instances that are replicating to each other. The vCenter HA replication mechanism is what is taking, uh, taking care of these two PSCs uh, being able to share the same information. So when there's a failover that occurs, the other embedded PSC comes online along with vCenter server itself uh, and everything is, is working normally. What about if we have an external PSC? So there's a, a very important decision that you need to make when talking about PSC and vCenter HA. Are you going to use enhanced linked mode? If the answer is yes, then you, in vSphere 6.5, you have to use an external PSC. We do not support embedded PSC replication at this time. So if I have a few external PSCs here, because I want enhanced linked mode, I'll draw my vCenter. Uh, we also require you to have a load balancer. The reason for this is, if I have my highly available PSC or vCenter configuration here where I have an active, a passive, and a witness, this vCenter is, could potentially be pointed to a specific PSC. Now, if we were to have a failure, then uh, if, let's say, this PSC failed, then we would need to manually repoint this vCenter over to another PSC. When we do that, that repoint mechanism does not replicate to the passive node. So the passive node is still pointed to this original PSC. And so you can see if we had a failure of a vCenter node and failed over to the passive node, then we would have a problem because the passive node is still pointing over to the failed PSC. So this is why the load balancer becomes very important when we're talking about high availability. One of the questions that I raise often is, why make the vCenter highly available, but not the platform services controller? If we can make both layers highly available, then we have a complete solution. Otherwise, we're providing a resiliency in vCenter HA, but then having to do some manual intervention uh, which contradicts the high availability principle uh, if we were to have a PSC failure. So the ideal scenario is if we're using enhanced linked mode and thus using external PSCs in conjunction with vCenter HA, we need to have these two PSCs behind a load balancer with the vCenters pointed at this virtual IP or VIP on the load balancer. That concludes this whiteboard session on vCenter high availability. You can find more information on the vSphere blog at blogs.vmware.com slash vSphere.